Now, I didn't plan to do this, but uh, you guys asked, so uh, let's talk some rings of power. Hey, what's up, bookworms and men and dwarves and elves and all those fine, fine creatures from the world of Middle Earth, guys? It is finally here. Rings of Power on Amazon has debuted, and if you haven't been around YouTube today, or yesterday, or the day before that, you know there's a lot of conversation going on about it. Well, the first two episodes have aired, they're titled A Shadow of the Past and A Drift, and uh, look, I wasn't planning to do uh, individual episode reviews, nor am I planning to do that after this, but I've had a lot of people asking me how I feel about it. Either they loved it or they hated it or they haven't even taken the plunge yet. They just like to know what I think about it. So I said, sure, I'll go ahead and talk about these first two episodes and uh, I'll let you guys know what I think about them. First off, guys, I want to say I, I read Silmarillion one time in high school. It was gibberish to me at that age. I'm not going to lie. That's why I put it on my list of books that I'd like to revisit because I feel like now I'm much more attuned to something like this than I was as a teenager. It was like that was just not what I was expecting. Uh, but uh, So I am not an expert on this stuff, nor am I married to second age of Middle Earth material here. So I kind of am able to go into this looking at it as a TV show. Uh, my thing is, guys, is I've read this seven times. Uh, I've read The Hobbit just as many times. I've read the appendices twice. I don't read those every single time. But here's the thing is I do know Amazon's rights are just for the appendices. So it's a very, very small segment of Middle Earth they're allowed to talk about. So here's the thing with this, guys, is I understand that there are rights issues or certain things are not allowed to do. And I think that's kind of helped me going into this being like, all right, well, you know, I'm going to do like I did with uh, season two of The Witcher, where I realized maybe they're not following the books as well as I had hoped for. But, you know, I feel like I can enjoy it just as a TV show. So if you don't know, guys, this takes place in the second age. Uh, no exact year is given. And I think that's because they want to condense this into like a single generation, this storyline, because I would imagine imagine that this story is going to go through the last alliance of, of men and elves. You know, for those who don't know these things, that is the battle you see in the prologue at the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring. I think that maybe that would be the ending of where this show is going. So I can see that they probably want to condense about, uh, I don't know, 2,500 to 3,000 years into this one single, uh, whether 50 hours of television is what they want to produce here. So I kind of get that, how they're going to have to make some changes and things like that. But look, uh, as far as where this is taking place, look, Sauron didn't start building Berdur until around 1,000 years into the Second Age, so it's before that. Okay, so uh, I think that we can say that this is safely roughly about 5,000 years before Frodo is born, and someone can check my math on that. I'm sure I'm way, way off, and that's why I said roughly, but again, uh, for people who don't know, yes, this does take place a long time before those movies that you do love. Next, I'm going to say, guys, if you went into this series wanting to hate it or wanting to love it, that's what you're going to get. Uh, with me, I was very neutral. I was like, look, there's lots of red flags that I don't like, but I'm going to give it a fair shot. I'm going to go into it with an open mind, and I think that helped me quite a bit. But uh, if you guys are looking for just an over-the-top negative, this is the worst thing ever, there's lots of other channels out there I think that you can find that are going to give you that. Uh, but if you're also looking for someone who's going to be, you know, this is the greatest cinematic Mr. masterpiece you've ever seen, I think maybe you should check out uh, Twitter.com. I think that's where you'll find more of that stuff. I'm going to kind of approach this as someone who's, uh, you know, open to some interpretation, some, uh, some, you know, going about them some things their own way. I might do some things like that. So uh, I think I might really upset some people like that. I'm not going to break down the lore for you or nothing like that. If you really want that, guys, I recommend the channel Nerds of Power. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Nerd of the Rings, rather. Sorry, Nerd of the Rings. He does really, really great breakdowns. And, and, and what I like about his channel is even if it's something he doesn't like that they're changing, he's very positive about it. So it's so hard to find positive content, it seems, on YouTube these days. But overall, guys, uh, I was mixed to positive on this. I, I liked a lot of things. I liked a lot more. Uh, look, I'm not going to lie. I was not expecting good things. And I, I came away pleasantly surprised on a lot. Uh, it's not perfect by a long shot. There's still lots of things I feel like they need to work on. But uh, overall, I, I, I liked it enough to keep going. I said what I was, was going to do is I was going to give these first two episodes a chance with an open mind and they could sell me on if they got me to continue or not. Because I said the, the phrase I've been using is I'm done hate watching stuff, you know, with them destroying IPs that I've grown to love over time. 
uh, with this. I felt like they, they sold me enough to keep going, but definitely not perfect. We're going to kind of talk about that. Lastly, before I begin, guys, I do want to say just my opinion. This is just my opinion. By nothing that I'm saying here am I invalidating your opinion. If you hated it, if you loved it, the things that I, I, I hate or love, perfectly fine by me, guys. It's always about a conversation here. So with that said, let's get into it. Let's begin with the first episode called A Shadow of the Past. And Amazon describes it as Galadriel is disturbed by signs of an ancient evil's return. Arondir makes an unsettling discovery. Elrond is presented with an intriguing new venture. And Nori breaks the Harfoot community's most deeply held rule. I think the best way to do this, guys, is kind of talk about what I liked is the best way to start here. I gotta say, look, Obviously, you're going to hear this from everybody. The visuals. It looks stunning, guys. Most expensive TV show of all time. It had better, better look good. But, you know, there were some things that were really, I think, might have underwhelmed me. But there's a lot of things where I'm like, okay, yeah, I can see the money on the screen here. The Valinor, obviously, is gorgeous to see. Uh, I think the, 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 the two trees of Valinor is just stunning. It's something that I've always kind of wanted to see. because I do, I do remember reading that in the appendices. Uh, the landscapes are just as epic as anything, I think, in uh, Peter Jackson's trilogy. The fact that they're real, you know, I think that helps. Not all CGI. It, it just it looks very, very impressive. And anytime we can see those big sweeping landscapes, to me, that just sings of Middle Earth, right? Uh, one of the little things that I really did like in this episode was those tree carvings that you see in Linden. Uh, there is some, you know, callbacks to some classic Tolkien stuff there, but uh, very, very cool. You can see that the, the money, like I said, was really, really sank into this, which they've made, n n they've had no problems boasting about how much money they've spent on this, and it must be nice to have that kind of money that you can just brag about that. But anyway, uh, I, you can see it. It would be one of those things, like, it isn't like a will of time, I'm like, where did they spend $80 million? Because this doesn't look like an $80 million TV show. Uh, with this, so yeah, it does. It does look. It does look grand in scale. So I, I, the visuals, yes, were as advertised. I, I wouldn't go quite as far as some people saying it looks like, uh, you know, cinematic, looks like a movie. Uh, but it definitely looks better than most TV does. I still don't think it has quite the same aesthetic as like House of the Dragon or Game of Thrones has, but it does look very whimsical. And I think it's what you kind of need when you're dealing with this world. But I do think they kind of have that thing where. They want to make it look absolutely majestic, but they also feel a little beholden to making it feel like Peter Jackson's trilogy. So uh, maybe if they kind of go out on their own a little bit there, they might have uh, some differences. But uh, yeah, it's as advertised. It is very beautiful to look at. I like the prologue on here. I I, I do wish that we could have seen Morgoth. You know, again, I, I know that there's things they can't do, but I didn't even expect to get a mention of Morgoth. And Morgoth's name... Uh, is in the characters' mouths more than once this season. So I think that's very, very cool. We kind of get that little cameo, if you will, of Sauron in his full regalia. That's That was really, really cool. But uh, I just I thought it was really cool. You see the large-scale battles, which doesn't look CGI. I don't know if that's all extras or not. But that's something I felt like the Hobbit trilogy was missing, was those big, epic shots like that. Seeing Finrod in that big battle and, and, and the relationship that him and young Galadriel have, that's a, a character that I, I some people have told me is quite different what they're doing, what they did with Finrod here but again that it's nothing that really really breaks the universe i think uh something else i liked was the map transitions uh maybe think almost like of a indiana jones kind of thing where it's it's showing the sweeping landscapes but it's also kind of you know with the map overlaid and kind of showing you where they're going i think that helps a lot of people who maybe only know you know the shire to mordor kind of areas of this map getting them a little bit more ideas and i know some people didn't like it i, I did i thought it was really really nice uh i, I don't know if this map actually was accurate to, you know, different time periods or not. I've heard some people say, I can't believe that this was missing on the map or whatever. So I didn't study the map enough on the show to know, okay, that's different from the actual map that we, you know, I can pull out of, I can pull out of this edition right here and see all those occasions. But again, uh, I, I thought it was a really neat idea. The soundtrack, guys, of course, is amazing. It's Bear McCreary. I talked recently about Bear McCreary, uh, how I think that that guy is the John Williams of television, has some of the most recognizable theme songs and some of the most beautiful music ever put to a television screen. And it does help to this feel like Middle Earth because the soundtrack, especially what he does in episode two with Kaza Doom, is really, really impressive and feels like Lord of the Rings to me. Most of the costuming I liked a lot. Uh, I did like some of the little details uh, on, on Elrond's costume and things like that. Uh, some of the stuff, uh, I, I'm like, I'm not really wild about the elves with short hair. If I have a nitpick, it's the elves with short hair and the lady dwarves without beards. That would be like my big nitpicks or whatever. Again, nothing that ruins the show for me. Just sometimes the, the, those hairstyles kind of take me out of it. Almost feels like they should be on Rome or something like that. It almost kind of feels like that. But, uh, but overall, most of the costuming is pretty impressive here. I do like the elvish armor and things like that. 
always the Elvish weaponry looks excellent, you know, and, and it still feels very much in the Peter Jackson kind of vein there. But uh, no real complaints about the costume. I know there were some concerns that things look kind of painted on or like 3D printed. Uh, I didn't see anything here that really just like took me out of it and be like, that looks like you're wearing something. Uh, I think there was some kind of a mixed thoughts about the Arondir, the, the elf's, uh, uh, his breastplate. I thought it looked awesome. Uh, other people said they thought it looked like a t-shirt. Uh, me and my wife, we both really liked it. So uh, there is that. Uh, I gotta say, Elrond is probably my most favorite part here. I'm not really wild about him as like somewhat of a politician, you know, a speechwriter, things like that. But he never seems like unrecognizable as that character that we have known and loved now. So uh, I, I'm interested to see this younger take on Elrond, which uh, very much seems like an emissary. So I, I'm actually okay with that. I just hope he doesn't get benched, if you know what I mean. Uh, I'm hoping that this is still the badass that we code, know, uh, have come to know and love in the last alliance and things like that. So I, I do, I, I'm accepting that the fact that there is going to be growth for some of these characters, and they might be different 5,000 years ago than what we recognize. But I, I like the actor. I like how he's, I love the conversation that he has with Galadriel in Linden here. It is really, really good. And I do believe that they've known each other for, for, for quite some time. So uh, it's pretty good. And, and Gilgalad, I think, finally getting to see Gilgalad is, is really awesome. Yeah, getting to see him, I felt like he had a commanding presence. He had the long hair. Uh, but I, I liked uh, everything about him. I felt like his speech had some, you know, some real potency to it. So I, I think that's a character that you can see why people would follow him. And uh, he seems like he's in charge. That's what uh, I think seems important, but still very, very small introduction form at this point. But what about what I didn't like about the first episode, guys? Narrative, narrative flow, easily. Uh, the narrative flow, I, I think, is very, very poor. Uh, I think they introduced too many characters too fast. They're hopping around way too much. I'm, all, I'm okay with a lot of characters. Like, I think back to the pilot of Game of Thrones, and a lot of my friends who hadn't read it said, uh, there's just so many characters. But they were able to get it because it didn't hop around so fast. This really hops between these four main groups here really, really quickly. I felt like they should have spent more time getting to know some of these characters before moving on to the next group because it does seem a little bit too much at first. I also felt like the first episode, guys, glacially slow, like really, really slow. Now, I'm an epic fantasy reader. I'm perfectly fine with a slow setup. That's fine. I'm surprised my kid didn't bounce, though. He, he was noticeably bored watching this episode. My wife fell asleep. Uh, she had to go back and watch it uh, later on her own to catch up before we watch episode number two. But I also feel like this was missing that hook at the end of the first episode. They kind of draw, like you think back, and I'm gonna, the comparison's gonna come up, guys. Sorry, it's going to come up a lot. You think about the first episode of Game of Thrones, you had the big hook with Bran. This one, I don't feel like you had that big hook enough, you know, with the, the meteor thing enough to get people who were already on the fence about watching it be like, well, I got to keep going. I feel like they could have had a better hook this first episode. So I feel like the first episode, the narrative flow really hurt. I don't feel like you're attached to any characters unless you already like Elrond or Galadriel. I think that might be the only reason you feel like any attachment to these characters because they don't really do it in this first hour here. I feel like the Harfoots are very forced, guys. This feels like the creators saying, well, it's Lord of the Rings. We can't not have hobbits in it. So uh, I just, and not really, it's nothing against any of the actors or anything like that. I just feel like they're forced in here. And they look almost like the Tinkers from Wheel of Time. I don't understand this. They don't look like hobbits at all to me. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. There's just something about it just doesn't really, this feels like Kokiri from Legend of Zelda or something rather. I, I'm not really getting these at all. The dialogue does suffer at times, guys. Again, this is nothing against the actors or actresses. I feel like just the writing, some of those lines are going to be impossible to deliver. Uh, Galadriel just repeating the same line over and over again was like, ah, I, like, I still don't even know why they put that in the trailer. I was hoping it was one of those that was in the trailer and not in the show. But uh, yeah, there's some dialogue time that can kind of seem like it's on the CW or something. And other times it just seems like they're trying so hard to write like Tolkien that I'm like, I don't think anybody would actually ever say that. But it's not a huge, huge problem. I think the ease of dispatching powerful foes is something that really, really drove me crazy in this episode. I'll touch on that more in my final thoughts. And I gotta say, Galadriel is definitely something I didn't like in the first episode. This is gonna be, you know, your primary character of this series. I, I think they did a very poor job of making her likable this first episode. In fact, I think she comes off as quite unlikable. Like when Elrond's just like talking to her, basically saying like, I'm telling you this because I'm your friend. She's like, you're telling me this because you're wrong and you just wanna tell me what to do. I, I just don't like that in the character. I, I just, she seems like no matter what anyone tells her, Look, you've never experienced pain like I have. You know, I, I feel like that's just making her come off as likable. And I think this is a problem with modern storytelling a lot with main characters is they make them just 
mean. They make them just ugly to everyone. I'm like, that doesn't make them likable or that they're the best at everything. I, I don't like that, you know, the, the way that she dispatches a, a foe so quick in this episode and it's almost like an eye roll, like she's even bothered to turn around. That really annoyed me about the character. So I hope that's something that they can work on. So... First episode, I was kind of kind of flimsy. Uh, if I said if I was grading out, I gave it about a six and a half out of ten. But episode number two, Adrift, I did like much better. Now, what Amazon says about this episode is Galadriel finds a new ally. Elrond faces a cold reception from an old friend. Nori endeavors to help a stranger. Arondir searches for answers while Bronwyn warns her people of a threat. So what did I like, guys? Casa Doom in all of its glory, not the wasteland that we knew in Fellowship of the Ring. This was stunning, guys. It really was. This was probably the money shot, so to speak. This is the one where I said, I see the money on the screen right now. This was gorgeous. I can't imagine anything in the cinema would have looked any better than this did. Absolutely stunning. Uh, I never would have imagined that, like, I love the way they showed, like, the sunlight, how they reflect the sunlight in there, because I never would have imagined that greenery could grow in there. That was really, really stunning. I was absolutely blown away by this, much like Elrond was on the screen. I love Prince Durin uh, the third. Uh, I think that, uh, I really did believe that he and Elrond we're longtime friends with a history, but they become estranged, and they have like this one scene on a lift that's actually quite touching, where he explains to him why he is not thrilled with Elrond being there. It's actually quite good. I actually did uh, feel like, okay, these characters have a history. So I felt like that already was better than any of the character moments in episode one. So I feel like they already improved upon that. So I like the relationship between those two, and I love the look of the dwarves. I love how they all got different. You know, they all do something different with their beards. Not everyone's going to wear their beard the same way. I do wish the ladies had beards. I'm not going to lie, but uh, I did like how Duran had his like braided. It was really really cool. So uh, yeah, I really like the actor playing uh, Duran, uh, Prince Duran as well. Uh, Elrond was great in this. Uh, I really really like the stuff with him and Celebrimbor. Uh, that's going to kind of be. Uh, uh, a power duo, I think, on this show is it's the relationship between him and Celebrimbor on here. So uh, I really did like Celebrimbor as well. I, I like that they talk about, you know, Feanor and things like that. And you can see that Celebrimbor is almost like, yeah, yeah, I've heard about how great my grandfather was, you know, really good. So I, I'm liking all of these castings. I've liked their character moments, like I said, in this episode, really good. I really did like the Sea Beast sequence, which I have since learned from watching Lord of the Rings is that this is called a fish dragon. <laughs> so I would have never known. It's like for everything epic that Tolkien has, he always has something like that. Just kind of, kind of that and the names of the uh, dwarf houses always kind of make me chuckle. Not a disrespectful way, and like that's of course that's what they're called kind of way. I, I like it a lot. I like that like this digger orc kind of thing that they had in here, and I liked it how. It was serious threat. You know, like, you think about, like, the orcs, when you watch, like, the original trilogy, and you've got, like, these great fighters are just taking orcs out like they're just, you know, ah, get off me, like they're gnats, right? Here you see the struggle that two humans who have never seen an orc before are going to have with one orc, you know, and, and Arondo has some, has some trouble with these orcs as well. So, it uh, looks awesome. I love that it. it's not CGI, a practical orc. You know, that's something I feel like they really, really just nailed with the original trilogy and suffered with on the Hobbit trilogy. So it looked really creepy, like how it had like the bull's head skull. That was really, really cool. Uh, but I, I, I dug the horror elements in this. Look, it scared my, my youngest twice. He actually kind of jumped, you know. So embracing a little bit of the horror elements down there in the tunnels with the Ron Deer, I thought that was really, really creepy, kind of set the tone quite a bit for this episode. And uh, yeah, I think that I, I liked this episode quite a bit compared to the first one. But what did I not like, guys, about this episode? Uh, the Harfoot stuff still is not grabbing me. Uh, it almost feels like they should be in another story. It, it doesn't feel like it belongs on the same show. It feels like they're part of another show that I'm watching right now that keeps interrupting my main show. Because it just doesn't seem like it fits with anything else that's going on in the show. Two episodes, this can change, guys. But as of right now, I'm still not digging it. The Stranger stuff is whatever. I'm hoping it has a good payoff. I'm just relieved that apparently it is not Gandalf. Uh, I was really, really worried that's what they were doing. But it is fun to read some of the theories on this gentleman here. Uh, I've been thinking it might be one of the Blue Wizards, you know, that since that's something that we never really get to know very much about, you know, in these books. Uh, so I would love it for the, to really expand on the Blue Wizards. I think that would be really, really cool. My wife thinks it's Radagast the Brown because, you know, he's talking to, to Bugs and stuff. I'm like, well, Gandalf talked to Bugs. She's like, oh, well, yeah, I guess you're right. 
Uh, another theory she has is that it's the Balrog, and that would explain why there's fire everywhere. So I'm like, huh, that's an interesting theory. So uh, lots of interesting theories about this character, but I think that that's more fun to do than what they're actually doing on the show. But again, I'm going to give it time to breathe. Uh, I'm still indifferent on Galadriel. I don't quite dislike her this episode, but I, I am kind of interested in this relationship, her and this Halbrand character, which are also lots of theories about who he is. I thought that was Ellen Deal at first, and I was like, why would he be on a raft in the middle of the ocean? Uh, and also, I think we see uh, Ellen Dill somewhere else later in the episode, but uh, I'm intrigued about that, and I think I found Theo, that is Bronwyn's son, kind of useless. Seems like the character who's just there to get into trouble, uh, but uh, we'll see what's going on with this uh, with this Morgul blade here. And So I I'm interested enough, but I, I felt like I was actually nitpicking for things I didn't like in episode two, whereas the first episode I had a list equally as long as what I did like. So this one I'd say is a solid seven and a half out of 10. So overall for the first two episodes, I'd say right now the show would be sitting at a seven out of 10 for me. That's higher than the first two episodes of Wheel of Time, but not quite up there with where I put House of the Dragon. So let's go ahead and talk about my final thoughts before I run, guys. Uh, look, I expected much worse. Uh, from the marketing and the PR, the way this was handled, the rollout for it seemed very disrespectful. And I could see, I can see why Tolkien fans were pissed, you know, and I can see that there's still going to be some that are very, very upset with this. Like I said, um, I'm, I'm viewing this just as a TV show and am I enjoying it? For the most part, yes. Uh, my kid liked the second episode a lot more than the first one. He's excited to keep going. My wife's interested to keep going. So they did their job. They've got all three of us excited to keep going. I'm with, I say for me, I would say like excited as much as I am intrigued enough to keep going because guys, look, uh, there's a lack of good fantasy on television. Sure, I'll take a second show. I, I thought probably third. I still, I still like Witcher. I know people have hot opinions about it, but I do feel like the plot and the character work need as much attention as they're giving the scenery and the landscapes. If they can do that, then I think they might be cooking with fire here. But uh, yeah, the Harfoots, I feel like they could have been scrapped and this would be a much tighter story. I said every time they're on the screen, I feel like it switched. I switched the channel to another show or something. And like I said, if Galadriel is going to be your series lead, they need to do something to soften her. Now, I'm not saying that she has to be like the greatest and everyone has to love her or something like that. I'm just saying that she has to have some redeeming qualities other than just she's a badass. I need something more than that. I, I need something more than that. Stop telling every character that what they're suffering from doesn't matter because what you've been through is worse. Stop doing that. Stop with the dispatching of OP foes really, really quick. For I got I gotta say, guys, the worst thing about this was okay, think back to Fellowship of the Ring, right? It takes nine people, including two or three of the greatest warriors on the planet, and a freaking wizard to take out a cave troll, and they still barely are able to do it, right? This character does it in two swings of a sword and, like I said, almost looks bored while doing it. That's stuff that's like, I know this is like a post-MCU world where they feel like they've got to do this, where a character just like goes, you know, and it's like not a big deal. It's not anything. It doesn't feel Tolkien to me. It, it, I need these characters to struggle a little bit and I need these characters to overcome things. That's what makes us like them. And I need them to stop talking down to everyone else. That's something that's never going to work with me with a primary or pr primary protagonist on your show. And it's never gonna work for me. I don't like when my main character is just rude to people. It says you ain't gotta be the nicest person on the planet. You can still be an anti-hero, you can still be a great character, but don't be a dick, I guess, is what I'm saying with my, my, my main character. So again, uh, I'd say this isn't close to House of the Dragon for me. It blows away Wheel of Time easily. So I'd say it's, it's it's somewhere around there. Something about HBO just gets this fantasy aesthetic that no one else seems to get. But this is this is, this is is good. I was quite impressed with it. Uh, I understand the people who did not like it. I can completely see where you're coming from, like Tolkien scholars. Uh, I can see some people, like I said, if they had already decided they were going to hate it. And the people that already decided they were going to love it, they're probably not going to give you uh, the most uh, fair review of these first two episodes. Someone like me where I was like, look, uh, probably wasn't the decisions that I would have made. I'm excited to see some stuff I don't know, you know? So uh, I, again, I think if you want some positive coverage, check out Nerd of the Rings. I think he's got episode recaps where he talks about the differences from the source material. And I personally appreciate that. So that's really, really cool. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I, I'm over the really ugly, nasty videos about this, about this show. And I'm also over the videos that are overly optimistic about the show and are just talking bad about the people that are being nasty about the show. So Billy, guys, 
I just want to enjoy TV, so that that's me. So if I came off more positive in this review than you were hoping for, ah, you know, it's just my opinion. I want to hear your opinion. Why don't you go ahead and drop in the comments below and let me know. Did you like this better than Wheel of Time? I feel like just about everyone's going to. Do you like it better than uh, House of the Dragon? Go ahead and drop all those things down below, guys. Beware, there are probably going to be spoilers for these first two episodes. And uh, go ahead and tell me what you're looking forward to for episode three if you are going to continue. And I will talk to you there.